Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Josh Schuler. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with the founder of Trade With Profile, Josh Schuler. Josh and I talked about his journey learning how to trade futures and why he chose to focus on volume and price using profile charts. Josh shares how he prepares, anticipates, and executes his trades, position sizing, process for staying with winning trades, and last but not least, what Josh is doing away from the screens to increase trading performance. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Josh. Josh, how did you get involved in trading futures? Anthony, I was completely stressed out. So I had, before, before I had started placing trades in futures, I was a, first a stock flipper and then a uh, equity options trader and i was completely and totally stressed like i well for one i didn't i didn't know what i was doing so the the, the problem was is that i had had an experience uh actually when i was getting gra going through grad school you know a friend of mine I, I stumbled onto trading by accident so i didn't even know there was this whole industry and how this thing worked and you know, he said, well, hey, I bought this stock. And I was like, well, how do you do that? I don't, I don't even know how you do that. And he goes, well, it's easy. You go to this website and you fund it to your bank account and you buy the stock. And I bought this stock, you know, the other day. And I did what like nobody should ever do, right? Is I, I went and bought, I, 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 well, first I cajoled my wife into putting money into this account. And then we bought this stock. Oh boy. And yeah, it was, uh, and, well, here's the, here's the bad thing is, is that <laughs> a month later it had doubled in value. So that that hooked me on trading for one. I mean, because because you're like, oh wow, where else do I get 100 percent return? Um, and and I was like, obviously I have got this nailed. Well, I mean, I I didn't realize that one we it was it was the the time that we would call the monkey trade. It was like so easy a monkey could do it because you're like 0809, you know, like where stuff was so undervalued that every equity. I mean, if you if you bought it, it, it was a good buy because just everything was so suppressed. And I didn't have all the emotional hangups of watching stuff go down, so I was you know happy to buy things. But um, I, I wanted to understand how to trade. And so, you know, that led to trying to find people to teach me how to trade. And I didn't know how you even learned about it and got connected through, you know, the first string of mentors, right? Everybody has these like string of mentors that they start going through to try to figure out. And I was still profitable, but basically what I was was an order filler. And, and that's this is the case with a lot of people that go and go to the internet or they go to try to find some place to learn how to trade is that basically they want people to call trades for them and then they just fill the trades. So that you're not a trader. Like you're not you're not actually working on the craft of the trade. You're basically just filling the trade. Well, the, that that also was anxiety inducing because the person who I was following was a very good trader, but if she was gone or you know one I didn't know if we were putting on a trade, I didn't know why we were putting the trade on, what was attractive about it. I couldn't have told you why we were wrong or when I should have taken the trade off. And if, if I, you know, took a moment away from the market, I felt like I completely lost the plot, which is, you know, so just felt like you were always glued to screens and you know, your quality of life starts to, to struggle. So how I got connected to futures was that the mentor that I was learning from was connected to another guy who was teaching people 
uh, futures trading, which I had no idea what a futures contract was. But he would talk about, you know, oh, you, you need to trade futures. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And um, and at the same time, the guy was using profiling tools. And what was most intriguing about it was how he showed up. So the person who was teaching me initially, although very good trader, was just it was just anxiety. It was like rapid fire. We're in six million trades. Um, I don't know upside from downside. And this other guy is like trading one product every day. And I was like, that just is a lifestyle thing is more appealing. <laughs> and, and so, and so that's what, that's what really got me, you know, started in, in futures was that that was the products that he was, tra he was, his trading. Hearing your story. One thing that I really, I think not enough people do when they begin their journey as a trader is see how customers trade first. Because yeah. I think that's so important for me being on the trading floor, seeing how other traders traded and how the desks operated, basically the, the backbone of the industry, right? Like learn from the bottom up. Too many people just open up an account and then just start trading without seeing how things work. And I'm curious what you learned from watching those customers that you were working with mm -hmm. and then what you took from that experience to then help you refine your own trading process. Yeah, I know that's a great question. So that, that was as part of my trading journey that I felt the part that I felt that was really missing was coming up from the retail side. Cause I completely came to trading from the retail side. Um, even though I grew up in Indiana, like I, you know, I wasn't in Chicago, I was on the floor. Like I didn't understand that world. And I felt like I needed to, if I had the opportunity to be in the industry and be on the institutional side, I would jump at that and actually ended up finding a introducing broker for RJO that was based out here in Colorado and got a chance to go be part of their team, which was really helpful in a number of ways. One, it, it, it affirmed that a number of the things that, that I had you know, cobbled together in my approach to markets were, were good and they were helpful. And then there were other things that I built assumptions on that just didn't matter at all. Um, and this, this is really helpful, especially for somebody that's coming from the retail side. You know, there's so many resources out there that you can use to apply for your trading. And everybody says that they're all effective and they all help. And, and it's a little bit like, you know, like every indicator that somebody puts on a chart. Yeah, they all work. And then they don't work. <laughs> like so, yeah. so, so which ones are, which ones are really helpful and which ones are not. And then like, how, how do these instruments that we trade, they actually have a history and they actually have a reason for why they exist. And that impacts how the markets operate. Um, it, it, it impacts the margins around them. Uh, it impacts a whole number of dynamics around like, what is this instrument that I'm actually trading? And that was something that I felt like I, ne I needed, I needed to understand that I, I always in my career, in any industry, I've been through a number of different industries kind of coming into trading. I always wanted to know, okay, here's this thing that we sell. Like what, how does it work? Like why, why is this a good thing for someone as a tool? Um, which I just brought that into trading as well. So at, you know, when I got to be uh, part of this brokerage team, you get to see order flow, you get to see orders of clients coming in and you know, some, what was, what was fascinating about that is you know, here are producers, right? So, cause you know, futures, you look at a commitment to traders report at the end of the week and there's, you know, there's the, the non uh, reportable that these are like the retail, right. And then there's producers and then the institutional commercial trades that are all listed in there, the ones that have to report. And so getting to actually see that order flow and seeing, you know, hundreds of accounts, their trades coming through and like what volume are they trading at and how are they managing the risk around that? And why are they putting that on? And some of them, some of those people are putting those trades on for no reason other than they're actually hedging against a physical commodity. People actually do that. Like one time we actually had, somebody had to deliver cattle to the CME. <laughs> like, and you, you got to pull out this like massive uh, binder on like all of the protocols to be able to do that, right? Because that actually ended up being the best thing for the client. But that was, that was extremely helpful in, in kind of putting the cap around my trading approach of you know, what, what works, what doesn't, what's a good thing to have in your toolkit and not, and, and the, the ultimate end of that was that, uh, I've distilled all the kind of two, two things that I think about in all of markets. And that's just price and volume. If you're going to focus any, any effort on anything, it's understanding the interplay of behavior around price and volume. 
because ev- whether you're your producer, whether you're institutional, whether you're retail, like everybody's got all their charts and they're like, well, see, you know, you know, my, the trade's going to do this or it's going to do that because this thing's on my chart. What? Like, like your chart is what drives decision-making in the markets. No way. You know, it's how, how are all, all participants interacting with it at all the time frames and all the capitalization levels. And the only two indicators that everybody looks at is price and volume. So if you can understand that it's uh, it can be one of those like, Damascus Road, like scales coming out of your eyes. And at least it was for me. Yeah, going back to you seeing the customers first, I can't stress this enough that new traders out there work for a broker or something like that because of exactly the things that you said. You get to see the order flow. You get to see the emotions that a trader is going through. You get to see different traders' processes. I mean, there's so many things you're learning without putting any money up at risk. And then from there... You could start to evaluate yourself and, and like you did, go in and refine your process. What I'd like to talk about next is why you primarily use profile for your choice of charting for your trading. So, and this is, this is going to sound, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but I, I traded for like five years and didn't realize that what I was looking at every day was an auction. That 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 the 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 continuous auction of price, you know, in discovery of participants, whether buyers or sellers. I, I didn't understand that, and I, I actually that's while well, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that, I admit it confidently now. But a lot of a lot of people, especially on the retail side, come to markets that way, and so I wish they understood that because because there's things that they understand about auctions that would make them better traders, but they're somehow like they lose that when they're looking at a chart. And getting exposed to profiling as a way to arrange market information, and that's all it does. Right? It, it just it just arranges market information so you can make better decisions. And the information that it's arranging is essentially price and volume. So it's it's showing you where are price levels where we find good acceptance, where you, both both buyers and sellers are willing to participate, and that where are prices where really no one's willing to participate. And the thing that you find out is that not every price is as relevant as another one. So that there are actually better prices to do business than another. Uh, a way that I explain that um, often is, you know, I think about a housing market because a housing market is a really good analog to uh, financial financial markets, specifically futures. And that you know, housing market is a continuous auction. It you know ebbs and flows in price over you know a period of time. And you know, think like in my you know my neighborhood, I could you know if if the comps of you know what prices you know cost. Well, I could sell, you know, I could offer my house 10% above those comps or 25% you know, up. And right now, because we're in a hot market, like it seems like these higher prices are you know, getting taken. Well, the question is like, would you buy that house above the comps? And why would you buy that house above the comps? So that motivation of why someone might buy the house above value, quote unquote, is the same thing that we can apply to financial markets. Because the, the same dynamics, the same human behavior is at play. And if something happens and all of a sudden there's a correction in the, in the housing market, it's going to go back first to wherever those comps were. Same things happen in financial markets. Uh, it's almost scary <laughs> how well it does that. Um, and so that, that's what, what profile has really been helpful for me is just help me figure out where, where do I want to do business and you know, what's, what's the likelihood of succeeding given that nothing's 100%. You know, like there's no 100% edge in markets, but I can have a better approach than another one. And that's a way to do that. For me in my trading, I look at three things. My preparation, my anticipation, and my execution. I want to start off with you walking us through your preparation. How do you prepare for a trading day? Yeah. Awesome. So there are two products that I spend. I look for intraday trades is, is NASDAQ futures and crude oil. Uh, the reason that for those products is that they are rel- relatively wide and I'm looking to capture a certain percentage of the range. I'm, I'm what I'd call a, an intraday swing trader. So I'm not a scalper. You know, I'm not looking for ticks. I'm looking for points. I'm not, you know, I'm looking for, you know, if, if crude's doing, dollar or so in range. I'm looking to do 25 cents, you know, somewhere in there. 
but those are my int- intraday products. And then I look at about 40 other futures products. If, if they're in a certain relationship of price to value across multiple time frames, then they become interesting. Um, so like right now, I'm, you know, corn is on my radar, uh, live cattle is on my radar just because we've had some massive moves that's distending price away from value. And so there's some opportunity there, but, um, with specifically to NASDAQ and crude oil. So how I kind of start is I look at, okay, where is in the context of this auction, which, you know, and, and you've had other, um, guests on the podcast have they've done a really good job of, of explaining this, but I'll just kind of give our spin on it. People talk about context. Uh, to give you an understanding of where, you know, what, 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 where is the auction attempting to go, and and how good of a job is it doing in that direction? Those are two great questions to ask about any market in your planning process, and I'm always asking that. I'm like, what, what discernible direction is there, if there is, and how good is the auction doing at that? And I've got a number of ways that I measure how good an auction is doing at that, and then I look at you know, where price is in relationship to value across multiple time frames, specifically the last week and the last month. So where's the, where was the most traded price by volume for the last week? Where is the most traded price for volume for the last month? And where is the current price in relationship to those? You end up finding that there's about nine orientations that you can discern between those three variables that can give you some really good context that you can see repeatable. Uh, I, I have kind of an, a repeatable approach based on those. So that's kind of the contextual stuff. And then I'll identify what are, I would call decision levels or decision areas, areas where I'm willing to make a decision. Either it's a target to exit a trade or it's a target to potentially enter the trade based on a setup. And how I determine those is on the historical auction. So I'll look at prior areas of what we call acceptance or areas someone else might say they're prior areas of consolidation. Basically, it's where historically we found buyers and sellers, often when we re-enter those prices, we'll re-engage some of those buyers and sellers. And it you know, doesn't always, sometimes we cut through them like a hot knife through butter, which that also tells us something, but at least it, it, it typically slows the auction and gives you an opportunity to make a decision. And so you know, I'll have a number of those levels above and below where our last price was, and then you know, off we go. And then there's, you know, once we get in the session, there's a number of specific setups in my playbook that I'm looking to uh, come forth and emerge, and uh, and if all the criteria are met, we put on the trade and we rock and roll. Hey everybody, I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E Mini Russell 2000 Index futures contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Next, I want to talk about the anticipation phase. You're sitting there waiting after you've done your preparation. You know what you're looking yeah. for. What then has to set up for you to then pull the trigger and execute a trade? How are you determining your stop and your targets? Yeah. So I'll, I'll walk you through for our, our development community. We have an anchor trade or a core setup that we try to get everyone to work through towards building consistency. And the, the, what's great about this approach is it, it is a very, it's a patient strategy. So it also teaches you patience. It's also easy to see. So it's based on range extension of, you know, what we in auction theory call the initial balance or that the first, the range of price of the first hour of trade. Now, what's really interesting about this, now people go like the first hour, you mean you just like gave up the first hour? Like, why are you waiting and not doing anything? Like literally, we're not doing anything for the first hour uh, because we want to see a number of different things. We want to see how wide is that range? Uh, we want to see how did we interact with prior references? So like yesterday's most traded price, how do we interact with that? And then what's the early order flow looking like? Is is it really strong? Is it discernible? You know, how is that? happening. And then once we see that extension, so here's why we wait for that extension. If you go back and look at five years of data, about a thousand trading sessions, there's a 97% probability that you'll extend that range. So if you're active in that first hour, you, you already have something to look for in terms of a reasonable auction expectation is that you'll see range extension of that first hour. Well, what if, what if you're short in the first hour and we extend the range higher? 
Because once you've extended the range, now there's only a 30% chance you'll see the other side. So, you know, it puts you on the defense. So what we instead do is we'll say, okay, wait and see that extension. So we get that IB extension. Great. What that also tells us is who, who was driving the activity of the auction? Who's the controlling player? So if I get extension higher, that tells me that there are what we call other time frame buyers that are active and sellers if, if lower. And so then we try to position ourselves either with that controlling player, um, we want to, if we can with strength, or we'll fade that player if we see their control weakening. And so like, I'll give you a case in, in point today. So, um, and this, this might date when we record this, but we had some really massive ranges today. Um, really massive ranges. Like for example, crude oil typically averages about 70, 65 to 70 cents in the first hour. We did $2 and 22 cents, <laughs> like, like massive range. Um, that is it. That is a massive range. So, and we extended the initial balance as expected. And so, at two dollars and twenty cents of range, I'm not looking to to go with that extension because I'm already statistically stretched. Now, could we go another two dollars? Sure, we absolutely could. But is it likely? Probably not. You know, if eighty percent of contract volume haps, happens in the first hour, who's left to give it that extra two two dollars or dollar or whatever range? So if I can just be patient and watch the exhaustion take place then I can take the counter trade and fade it back. And so that's what, that's the trade that we look for. So we just watched, watched, you know, basically on a 30 minute basis, you know, when do we get a lower low? And then, you know, we trigger on a, like a five minute, two minute time frame, and rotate back toward developing value on the day. And that, you know, that got us our 20, 23 cents, you know, and a very high probability standpoint. When, when that first hour's range is real tight, then we'll look for pullbacks into that range to you know, find a trigger for further ex extension uh, to go with that controlling player. But that's a that's a that's a fantastic setup that you can look for every day, and that it's one that we uh, harp on as far as you know. If you have a playbook of trades, you want to have trade setups that you can look for uh, every day that can help generate an idea. And that was that was something like when I was developing as a trader, like I'd sit down, I didn't know what I was looking for, I had no idea what I was looking for, and that that added to some of the anxiety, but like what you're talking about in the anticipation stuff, if I know what I'm anticipating for, I know what to be patient for, you know? So if I'm waiting for, if I'm waiting for exhaustion, well, what do I need to look for? I need to find like some of the behaviors that we'll tend, tend to look for is we'll look for, okay, we're, we're, we're shooting higher. Who's that last. And this, this, and you'll, you'll know this from, you know, being on the floor and the institutional side, who is that last knucklehead who bought and was, you know, the laggard to the auction? Like who bought with volume because they just believe the thing was never going to go down. And then we immediately trade back through where they bought. Like I love that stuff because you know now they're trapped and they become an aggressive seller to, to cover their position. And that's where we're entering. And now we, you know, now we know that the auction has confidence. That it's not going to be able to go, you know, can it go higher? Sure. It's just not likely. So that's something to lean into. Or, you know, we'll, we'll wait until we see, you know, some kind of spike in the direction that we want to go. And, and join those traders and go with them. And what's cool about that is, you know, I, I use it on those two products because you know, they, they're fairly wide and they give some good opportunity. But it's, what's cool about it is it's product agnostic. So if you don't like the width of the, of the NASDAQ or crude, you can do it on the ES. You could do it on soybeans. You could do it on bonds, you know, whatever the product, notes if you want even something smaller um, and have that as kind of a core to your approach. It's very effective. A few things I want to dig a little bit deeper on. Number one is... I think you briefly touched on it, but I, I just want to know if you could, if there's a specific way that you determine a stop. So I understood kind of how you, you're getting yeah. in, but how are you mm -hmm. determining, you, you know, do you use a hard stop even? Like, how does all that work? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll try to describe this in an audio way <laughs> without being able to look at the chart. Yeah. But uh, so I, I will, I always, I'm constructing a trade on a 30 minute time frame. And that's kind of classic profiling. And, and, and while we're talking about that, there's two types of profile. So there's market profile, which has these letters and numbers and looks like this weird bell-shaped thing. And then there's volume profile, which is profiling the, uh, the, the volume at price. They're actually two distinct things. We, we use them for two different ways. So the, the market profile helps us discern control, 
the shape of the day expectation of what the auction is going to look like. The volume profile helps us figure out what levels are of interest. Um, so that that helps start the opportunity. Is And specifically, a great opportunity to look for is when there's a divergence between price and value. So if I, if I see you know, a lot of acceptance at a certain price, and then I see the auction attempting higher. Well, if it's going higher away from value, those people got to get other participants going with them or else they're going to get trapped and we're going to come back to value. So if that condition is the case, it was the case today, crude oil, what I'm looking for then is I'm looking for specifically on like a five minute time frame, I'll look for what I call an order flow spike. And, and most people can see this. It's just a, it's just a spike in volume on a five minute that stands out. Like I want to see a standout period. Uh, if you're using order flow tools like cumulative delta or uh, you know some type of volume breakdown that's showing you uh, the difference between buyer, you know, volume on the bid and the ask, that's also really helpful as a, as a confirmation. But I'm looking for a strong impulsive uh, trigger. And just like the the law of thermodynamics, objects that begin in motion tend to stay in motion until op acted on with an equal and opposite force, auctions work similarly. So, you know, the auction will keep going until somebody presses on it in the opposite direction with enough force to shut it off. And, and when that happens, I just, you just identify where did that start from? Um, often there are stops just be, beyond that. And that's where we put that. So, I mean, we're typically looking at a one tick, two tick stop beyond wherever the base of that order flow starts with. And you could see them pretty clearly if you're using like a five minute, uh, even a 10 or two minute uh, if you're using peer, you know time frame, whether you're using if you're using volume bars or Rinkos, you know same thing. You can keep the risk really tight, and that, that's that's uh, and then those are hard stops. We don't move them. Um, as we're constructing the trade, the other part of that and why we use a smaller time frame to trigger is I always like to look for a risk reward ratio that's like a three to one. So if if I want to look for you know twenty cents, twenty five cent target, which I can pre identify that, well then I'm not risking more than five to seven cents. Um, in that opportunity. Understood. A, a few other things I want to talk about. Position sizing. Are all trades always the same contract size? Because like so for someone like me, like I have what I call like a money trade, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Where I know that that trade is a trade where I'm going to allocate more risk. I'm going to trade bigger on it because that trade is my favorite setup. And I know yep. trades where I look at conditions and I go, you know what? I'm going to just trade this smaller, uh, you know, you, you recognize scenarios to where maybe I wouldn't even trade as well. So I always think big, small, or not at all. Do you have, <laughs> right, that's, do you, so, that's really wise. Did you have something in place that helps you decide whether you should be trading big or smaller or not at all? Yeah. It, very similar to yours. The the only added thing that I would add to it is, is volatility cycles. Okay. In terms of the expected width of the market, you know, like like right now, um, you know, we're expecting like a dollar twenty crude oil. We're we're expecting um, about a hundred to one hundred twenty points in Q, and that's that's what the option markets are pricing in. So that's a reasonable expectation. There's about a seventy percent chance we'll stay inside of those ranges. Now, I mean, we're we're certainly seeing exceptional stuff beyond that. But when you have wider markets, because I, I remember, and you'll, you'll know this too, I mean, there are periods of cyclical, cyclicality in volatility where, yeah, we have 100 points right now. Grief, uh, three years ago, we were doing 10 points for the whole day in the NASDAQ. We were doing three points in the ES. So you can, you can uh, I, I don't use the same size. I, I, I size smaller in much more volatile markets and then you know size up when the volatility is not there. So that's, that's kind of the general rule of thumb we use. So because it sounds like just because it's a wider stop, so you want to have the ability to stay yeah. within the trade, right? Yep, that's right. Another thing I want to talk about is holding a winner for a bigger move or if something comes up just shy of the target, you know, what do you do in that, in that particular instance? Yeah. Well, so the, and this is a, this is a, it's a great question. Like how do you, how do you stay with the winning trade? And, you know, we, we've, I, and I, this just came out of my own development of just trying to be more consistent. Right, because there's no 100% setup in markets. Anybody who tells you that is likely selling you something. I mean, literally, they're probably trying to sell you something. But um, there, there are four questions that I found that I keep using to help to find the trade. Because, like, you think about how the brain works against you once you're in a trade. Like, if you're, even if you're wrong, the brain is trying to tell you that you're right. 
And I think Denise Scholl has done some uh, great work like around behavioral alpha and talking about how the brain will start working against you and some of the biases once you're in the trade. So you have to define the trade before you put the trade on. So we use four questions every time before we put a trade on. And, and if, and if a developing trader comes to us, uh, this is where we start. We're like, look, you do not put a trade on until you can answer these four questions. So the first is, well, what's the opportunity? Like why this trade? What, what is it about this? And it could be like within profile language, we, there's something called a structure cleanup. So you could be looking to clean up structure. You could be looking to you know, fade the IB. You're looking to go with the IB. You could be looking to um, take a you know, second move on a binary event like an EIA, whatever the opportunity is there. But can you quantify it in terms of a price target? So let's start there, like a real objective target. Okay, from that, then the second question is, what am I willing to risk to go after that target? And then that's, you know, like with the crude trade today, I ha we saw a target that was about 25 cents. Okay, well, what am I willing to risk for that? And that was a reasonable target. Um, it, it was, could we have gone more than that? Sure. But the reasonable target was about 25 cents. Okay, well, what am I willing to risk to get that 25 cents? That's the second question. Then the th third question is, well, what would tell me that I'm right? Because, you know, like as traders, we're really storytellers. Like we, we, because we're making decisions on the right, of the right edge of the chart, we're creating a narrative of where we believe the story will go next. And, and certainly some are better storytellers than others. But when we're putting on a trade, we had in our mind what that story would look like. So, okay, let's, let's articulate that. What should, what should happen? What should not happen? Okay, if, if I'm looking for a you know, trade to, to go directionally, what should I see? I should see more volume in the direction that I want to go. I should see any counter direction, like direction that's going against me. I want to see really weak, and I want to see it get slammed back, you know, back away from me. Uh, that's the, the the next part. And then the last question is, well, what would tell me that I'm wrong? Like, what should I not see? So, like today when we, we were taking a fade trade, so you're fading a large move market. Well, what should I not see? I should see I should not see the aggressive buying and people lifting the offer. I should see the weakening of the offer, which is great. Uh, I should not see volume spikes against me. Like I should see, uh, I should see the, the divergence between price and value remain because that was part of the key components of the trade. As long as that stuff all stays in place, you stay in the trade. And then as you're moving in the direction of the trade, then we, we use those smaller timeframes to just help trail to protect you know, as we get into the, the target and then eventually we're using like OCOs, like, you know, at the target and then a trail, uh, just to protect against, you know, some type of binary event or in the world that we live in, maybe a tweet <laughs> that, that, that can, uh, that can come in. I really like those four questions that you talked about there, because to me, it brings great awareness to the situation. Right. And it's not something that a trader has to look at on a piece of paper, because once you know those four questions, those are, those are things you're just asking yourself on a regular basis. Yep. Yep. And they, they are, they're, they're every, everything that we know about how the brain works, especially within trading, because it is, it's such a, it's such a compressed cycle of success and failure. And the brain just hates that. Right. So having a, having a way to pre think how you will operate, really increases your chance for success. And what's it also can help you figure out, well, why, why is something broken? Like what's not working? Often what you find is that one of those questions wasn't answered. Um, especially like if you go hunting on YouTube, like learn how to trade, you'll find like, all of these people are like, well, here's this, here's my system to get into the trade. And you, I mean, like if you looked at order flow and all the new order flow tools that are coming out, you're going to find all kinds of triggers to be in a trade. The problem is, is that you can't, you can't validate that trigger versus another one. They all are as valid. So some of them, you you know, if you played the trade out, some of them, you're, it's like a one-to-one -one risk rate, re reward ratio. Some of them, it's less than that. It's like a 0.25 to 5 risk reward ratio. You just don't know. And so by having an idea of, you know, what's the target is important. The other thing is, you know, what's your reason? Like I, I, I use profile. I, that, that's my approach for defining opportunity. But if you're a fundamental trader, like if if you want to look at um, if you want to look at WASDA reports and grains, you want to look at you know EIA reports, and you, you want to build a trade based on a fundamental idea, that's totally great. That's what you know built the opportunity. If you see a strong economic data, for example, if you see you know increased crush in inventories and crude, so supply is coming off, that's 
that should be bullish for the commodity and you want you see prices moving lower even though the economic ideas are bullish that's an opportunity for you okay so what should that mean that as long as that dynamic exists the trade is still there and then you know what what i found and this is especially when i found you know working on the brokerage desk is i'd find people put on a trade for a fundamental reason but then they would stop out of it or they do something else because of a technical reason or some pattern based idea which diminishes you know, and, th and then the trade would eventually come in their direction because the fundamentals eventually converge, <laughs> and the, which which they do. They just most of us can't stay solvent long enough until they do converge. But um, that it's it's a, those questions are so great for you to be able to like, okay, why am I why this trade, and what you'll if you do it a lot and spend a lot of time in deliberate practice, kind of going through each of those trades, you'll find out, hey, here's a trade I shouldn't take. Like, for example, this year, I'm, I'm taking way less trades early in the in the day than I did last year, which has significantly increased my win percentage. So I went from about a 65% win rate to an 83% win rate just by removing trades taken before um, that first hour is over. Because when I went back and looked at the trades, I was like, I'm – my performance sucks. <laughs> like if I, but if you can't parse those out, then they stay part of your playbook and your whole playbook, to, you know, struggles. Last question before we get into rapid fire today mm -hmm. is what are you doing, if at all, to work on mental health, physical health? I'm a big believer that doing things away from the screens have helped me with my trading. What are you doing away from the screens to increase trading performance. Yeah. So, so two things that are, are consistent and disciplines exercise, um, using disciplines like yoga, which I know you're a great advocate for, um, exercise and, and eating well is one. And then also just a lot of intuitive understanding of myself, even spiritually. Um, I actually, and we, we haven't talked about this a whole lot. We haven't talked about this at all. But you know, my background actually for seven years, I was a pastor uh, before I even came to markets. And so that you know, understanding who I am and what it means to be really human, uh, it impacts every aspect of my life, even my trading. Specifically, uh, who do who do I perceive myself to be, and who am I really? And and I find that as a trader, I can I can get myself into believing things about myself that aren't true, which will diminish performance. So, you know, so I'm always trying to have conversations about like, okay, are you just lying to yourself here? <laughs> and because you just don't want to deal with reality um, because, you know, holistic, uh, holistic view of humanity and spirituality should lead you towards reality, which means that if there's an issue, I need to deal with it. Um, and that even comes to my trading. I love it. Great stuff, but we're not done yet. Rapid fire questions next, if you're ready for those. Yeah. All right, everybody, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Try it now for free at tryttnow.com. Josh, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Terry Lieberman, who owns Window Trader. Terry has a similar background to me in that he did a lot of strategic business consulting, had a lot of struggles early on as a retail trader, and just kept at it. Massive, massively gritty and resilient guy who believes a lot in process and has, was, has been successful, continues to be successful. And uh, I, man, just really, really great guy to know. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? <laughs> uh, first, knowing that I'm wrong. And then doing the things that are appropriate once you recognize that you're wrong. How has your trading process evolved over the years? Way more disciplined and patient than it used to be. But part of that is I know what to wait for. So that helps facilitate that. Um, we talk a lot about looking for the bag of money in the corner. Um, but that means that I take like one or two trades a day when in the past I may have taken 10 to 15 to 20 trades. Um, so it's, it's definitely – a much more sustainable rhythm now. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? So resilience, I think a lot about resilience and keep getting up because you're going to get knocked down. I mean, you're going to take losses. And if you're not that that's, there's some, a reality check that needs to be at play there. 
Um, but if you have a process that you can rely on, then the resilience really helps you get to the development where you'll be successful. Favorite book about trading? <laughs> so I have four. <laughs> uh, Richard Thaler's book, Misbehaving on Behavioral Economics, is excellent. Uh, Dan, and Chip, Dan and Chip Heath's book, Decisive. Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers and a trading industry book that I would highly recommend is One Good Trade by Mike Bellafore. What's the best piece of advice that you received about trading? Thinking about trading as a business. Yeah, that's the one I keep coming back to. If you had to pick a profession other than trading, what would you pick? If, if I was not a trader, if I could pick, I would be a professional cyclist. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? Um, hey, the thing that you're looking at is an auction and you know how auctions work because you buy things on eBay. So just figure that out and use these tools to help you make better trading decisions and you'll do great. Oh, and by the way, do like deliberate practice because it requires that. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge trading with profile, what would you say? Uh, the edge is in the divergence between price and value. So figure out where value is and then how price interacts with value and you'll be fine. You'll find all kinds of opportunities. Last question for today. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not trading? Uh, being outdoors with my family and if I get the chance, escape up a mountain canyon or out on a trail on one of my bikes. Nice. Josh, where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? Yeah, so tradewithprofile.com is the universe for all things Trade With Profile. And you can also connect to us on Twitter at Trade With Prof. Josh, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show. Yeah, man. Thanks, Anthony, for all you're doing for the industry and for traders. I, many of us could not survive without you, buddy. You're like <laughs> a lifeline to uh, <laughs> help us keep going when it's hard. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.